the right side in order to divide backbone line and customer line in order to reduce the danger of wiring. We have three minutes. And the next is a tough right cable. This is a, one of the bend of in, in, in incentive fiber and very tough against bending. So we tested this fiber by bending 1900 degree and <coughs> this fiber is very strong against bending, especially for uh, 10 G base ER. And the next is uh, UTP cables. We use the uh, uh, named echo patch cable. This is uh, UTP cable is very, very easy to wire cables because it's really soft and thin. And but uh, we are using this manage this UTP cables for management networks or uh, office networks, not for customer connect, uh, communication. And fifth is a cable tag. We are using small tags with a printed sticker. And this sticker says uh, rack number and equipment number and port number. We don't manage or assign cable ID for each cable. And the front side is a white sticker. And this indicates a source port. And the back side is a yellow sticker, which indicates a destination port. And we tag the one of the duplicate, duplicate the duplex fiber in order to distinct a cross or a straight. And the, this, these tags is uh, tagged in advance uh, before uh, wiring in order to so, reduce a mistake of miswiring. And the final, uh, toolbox. We put the same toolbox in each box. And these are pictures. And please see this later in your face. And so there are some USB ESR, these drivers, and nippers, cable picker, tags, and uh, fast aid kit, or attenuators, port cleaner, fiber cleaner, razor, and optical parameter, and tape, and caps, nuts, screws, and fabric fastener, and the vinyl ties. So everything needs to the operation is stored in the pop. And these are uh, patch panels we are using, and we are going to introduce this, this kind of tools. Thank you very much. <laughs> Please share, share your best practice. Thank you very much. OK, next up. I'm not starting the timer yet, because I'm not organized. but. Thank you very much. Uh, the topic is self-explanatory, a little bit new as topics go uh, in this particular uh, in the marketplace. And uh, I'll jump right in and really explain purpose of the talk. Is it working or no? Very good. At APNIC 36, my partner and president of IPv4 Market Group, Xander Brown, presented the 10 steps to a successful APNIC transfer. Step number one in that process was internal planning uh, for IT and network professionals, uh, which is really premised on structuring a budget and, of course, a business case for your executive to approve. The challenge within that, of course, is whether there's a good, solid comprehension of what constitutes market prices uh, to acquire IPs uh, through uh, legitimate transfers. And that's what I'd like to focus on today is just provide some knowledge transfer uh, based on our experiences over the course of the last near three years as to what prices are across all block sizes to support uh, and facilitate the internal planning process. When we talk about market pricing, uh, it probably deserves a definition. Uh, market pricing to us simply consists of a buyer that pu puts forward an offer, which is of course going to include price and certain conditions, be they business conditions or legal conditions, and a seller that accepts those. Of course, that would be one data point, and one data point does not constitute a trend, much less a pattern. So we've made sure with anything that we're presenting, 
and it's based on our 75 plus transactions that are completed or in progress. And by in progress, I mean a buyer has put an offer forward, a seller has accepted that offer, and they have progressed through the trilateral non-disclosure agreement uh, with ourselves, and the range has been inspected by the buyer to their satisfaction, and they're then moving to the commercial agreement before moving to the regional internet registry transfer. So that being the background and what constitutes market pricing and our experiences uh, to fortify some of these numbers, uh, this really began quite publicly, as many of you would know, with Nortel and Microsoft uh, back in March of 2011, where the price of $11.25 US per IP on what was an equivalent of about 10 16s. Very shortly thereafter, uh, another bankruptcy uh, proceeding that was uh, very, very publicly disclosed, and that was Borders uh, going Chapter 11 in the United States and selling slash 16 to Cerner Corporation for $12. So, those were the benchmarks, and from that point forward, there has been a soft decline in pricing from those benchmarks that were established. And you'll see, um, as I'd mentioned, uh, when we do uh, the trilateral non-disclosure agreements, that prohibits us from discussing individual companies or prices, but we can apply in aggregate so long as we have sufficient data points to support internal planning for organizations that are interested in perhaps procuring. And that's what we're showing here, average prices over the last 24 months and there has to be a minimum of three transactions per block size. Again, bearing in mind, this is ripe region, this is Aaron, and this is a Peanut region transfers uh, that are being aggregated together. What influences price? Well, obviously supply demand is, is the major macro factor, but if you just look at a buyer and just look at a seller and how they come together, there are certain micro factors, least uh, of which, and first and foremost, is a seller will absolutely demand that a buyer be pre-approved by the Regional Internet Registry. No point in allocating your precious legal resources, technical resources, and uh, business resources to a transaction and a transfer if you can't proceed with 100% certainty that's going to be approved by the Regional Internet Registry. Uh, same thing from a buyer perspective. Uh, after they inspect the specific range, they know who the seller is, they know the integrity of the IPs, and they're going to demand that, uh, that it's accurately registered in the database, or at least that there is uh, staunch evidence of chain of custody. And then moving down, urgency to procure, if a buyer needs IPs within 30 days, uh, be rest assured they'll offer a premium. If a seller is desperate for revenue and wishes to monetize, uh, be rest assured they'll offer a discount, and, and, and that causes for more fluctuation. Other such things as governing law uh, and dispute resolution. Again, if a buyer demands that it be German law and a seller wants to uh, assume that risk without familiarity of German law, they may ask for a premium price uh, per IP. Uh, payment methodology, same thing. Buyer may want escrow. A uh, seller may want a bank guarantee. Somebody has to acquiesce, and that will either cause a premium or a discount in the price, working through those terms. More recently, throughout 2013, uh, organizations with experience doing commercial transactions and transfers are coveted. Uh, so if a buyer returns and wishes to procure more IPs through legitimate transfer channels, uh, a seller will offer a discount. Uh, to be able to embrace that knowledge and that expertise and, and presumably it can happen expeditiously. Same thing vice versa uh, with a seller that has sold blocks previously. Uh, buyers are interested in that and will pay a small premium just for the benefit of dealing with somebody that understands uh, the mechanics of the commercial transaction as well as the transfer process. To get a little bit more specific, everything was aggregated and if we look at things from a regional standpoint, uh, in RIPE region, which is of course Europe and the Middle East, uh, this particular chart shows 2013 transactions uh, by quarter. Uh, they may be multiple data points uh, that are within each quarter, but it paints an odd picture that is sometimes surprising to individuals because prices went up so much and then dropped down. But let me explain one more anomaly, if you will, in the transfer market. In RIPE region, uh, legacy resources, also known as ERX, uh, do not require needs-based justification historically. So again, buyers, uh, whether they could or couldn't justify it wasn't their point. They didn't want to allocate the time to it. And we're more than willing to pay a premium for IP to any seller that had legacy assets because policy proposal 2013-03 in RIPE uh, has been implemented, of course. There is no benefit uh, to a seller to have legacy assets anymore. Uh, it might as well be allocated PA because there's no longer uh, needs justification that's applied based on 12 months planned utilization. So an allocated PA block and a legacy block uh, have come back down around the $10 mark. Aaron A. Penick transfers, you'll notice that it started off at around the $10 mark, again, slash 15s and 16s, uh, but started to decline. 
And again, facet of supply demand, there is abundant uh, su supply, excuse me, supply in Aran region. And uh, that's why we started to see a decline. The low point there, if you take a look at all of the things that I suggested a buyer could do to reduce price, they did. And that's why it was a low price and has since jumped up towards year end to, uh, to 950. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll just show that. That's an example of a slash 20 uh, in ripe region. Uh, at least five transactions there. And you'll notice that the price uh, being at around 14 a quarter, scaling all the way up to 17. But the 17, again, is an anomaly. Uh, it had to be done within a month uh, for the buyer. And uh, $15 is really the, uh, the going rate. So check my time. Doing all right. All right, for 2014 predictions, I, I would stop and say if we were looking out to 2017, uh, I would just simply not be qualified uh, to offer any insight for internal planning purposes for IT professionals. Uh, there are too many variables to consider, and I'm not a macro or microeconomic uh, major, but I can say with some certainty what we'll see in 2014, and that is there'll be very little change. Uh, if you look at ripe region, uh, because it's only uh, within ripe the transfers are permitted, so it has to be a ripe source to a ripe recipient. Supply is challenged. Demand is fairly brisk, so I think we can see with some certainty that by the end of 2014, prices will climb in RIPE. Aaron, uh, probably set to run out of free pool by the end of 2014, so expect no impact uh, to pricing within Aaron region. And uh, same thing goes with APNIC, because they're inextricably tied through interregional transfers. A price in Aaron is the same as a price in APNIC. So just going to the bottom, again, for internal planning, budgeting purposes, it's very safe to assume the following for 2014. Aaron region, uh, $9 US, as well as APNIC for larger blocks, like a 15 or 16, scaling all the way upwards to around $13 US per IP on a 20. And conversely, in RIPE, uh, where there's about a buck to $2 difference uh, for block size uh, per IP, you can anticipate at least $10 US for a 15 and 16, scaling upwards to approximately $15 US for a slash 20. We have one minute for questions. So again, please use the mic. No questions? No? Oh, well, thank you very much. You OK, we're talking about NTP next. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kaname Nishizuka from NTT Communications. As a member of NTP Talk Work Group in Janok, Japan Network Operators Group, I'd like to talk about NTP reflection attack. So for the starting point, how many people in this room are annoyed by NTP attack? Please raise your hands. Wow, it's a very hot topic. Uh, on Tuesday, uh, Mr. Jeff Houston had made a presentation about NTP already, so I'd like to make an emphasis on observations and reactions in Japan. So I'll make a quick uh, review about NTP reflection attack. NTP reflection attack is using spoofing and uh, reflection. Uh, the victim IP uh, victim's IP address is spoofed, and reflector is inappropriately configured NTP servers, routers, and switches. The most effective reflection is NTP monolith command. That is because the amplification is over about 100. 100. So maybe uh, you are familiar, already familiar with this kind of illustration because the problem structure is uh, almost similar to DNS and attack. So here's the observations. Uh, in NTT.NET, our global IP backbone, since last December, we started to observe uh, increasing NTP traffic. And at this time, NTP traffic happens every day. And uh, attack size is usually around one gig DPS. And not all of the customers are aware of those attacks. So it could be uh, one of the reasons why there are still many open NTP servers 
all over the world. So January 29th is monumental day when Japan experienced massive attack almost 100 gig for the first time. We grasped uh, traffic data of one of Japanese customer. As for this customer, they had not experienced NTP attack at the middle of January. However, uh, they are attacked by reflected and amplified 100 gig NTP traffic two weeks after. The attack was distinct to only one IP address, which was just suburban subscriber. And it was from all over the world. Interestingly, before the big big rate, big big rate, reaching about 100 gig, there uh, uh, the traffic stopped. Uh, sorry, I don't, thank you. Traffic stopped for two hours. We don't know why, but we are assuming that it's a preparation. If you know why, please teach me. And we blocked the traffic uh, by filter based on port one, two, three, and subsequently we used black hole routing because the uh, CPU usage of the router hit high. So why they are using NTP? Uh, here is a comparison of UDP protocols. Potentially, these protocols can be used for reflection attack. And theoretically, uh, NTP with monolith command has the largest amplification. And in reality, uh, NTP amp attack is quite effective. We researched open NTP and open resolver, which are abused by attackers. In the case of NTP, we, the most of amplica amplification is 50 to 200. And in the case of DNS, the most of amplification is under 50. So average amplification of NTP amp is about 100. So this means that only 10 mega traffic can trigger one gig attack easily. So mo moreover, uh, there are many, many vulnerable NTP servers in all, all over the world. So you may know already about monolith command. It's super effective because it can get list of 60, uh, six 100 NTP clients addresses and information only by one command. This, this is equivalent to 44 kilobytes and 100 packets. So not only BPS, but also PPS is amplified. And most of the answer is 44 kilobytes. The fear of NTP attack is that attackers can inject false NTP clients to make the attack massive. Yeah, uh, I'd like to introduce one of the case of NTP reflection attack. The unique point of this case is that uh, one of subscriber became an open NTP and uplink up of access line was congested. So many other subscribers claimed that they cannot use the internet. Uh, there are many ways to stop this attack. Uh, BCP38 in source AAS is, is ultimate solution, I think, but prompt action was required. So to ask customer to change their configuration is important action. However, it could take long time. So using specific filter to stop the triggering traffic was an one of emergency evacuation plan. So here is the list of Countermeasures. First, to stop yourself from becoming reflector, review your own equipment. And to stop customers from becoming reflector, contact customers to change their configurations and uh, proactively propagate uh, harmless NTP configuration templates. And filtering destination UDP 123 by HCLs can stop triggering traffic. Second, to protect customers and myself from reflected attack, you can filter source port 
one, two, three UDP packet by ACLS. UDP is a symmetric protocol, so uh, source port of UDP is uh, one, two, three, maybe you think, but the source port of most of UDP attack is not port one, two, three. It's 80. Or uh, by mitigation devices and services. Maybe it's super expensive, but, but it can be work. Uh, finally, to keep out any reflection attack from uh, the internet, uh, deploy source address validation altogether. So there are many options about useful countermeasures. So we established work, work group for uh, talking about NTP related issues. The one, one of the chair is Miki Takada-san. She is sitting there. Uh, target is coping with NTP related issues, especially about NTP reflection attack. We will make outputs uh, as documentation about NTP and re NTP reflection attack. And it will be available in Japanese and, of course, English. So this is the main message of this presentation. Uh, stop NTP attack and save NTP service services. We will clarify the technical problems and make useful references. Over filtering could happen if there are no cooperation among communities. That's why we named the work group NTP talk because we should now rethink about usefulness of NTP and operate it appropriately. Please contact us to input your operational practices. Thank you very much for your time. Forty-five seconds for questions. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you very much. Okay, next up, who got, we're talking next. I looked it up and I forgot. Oh, Jeremy. Jeremy here. Oh, yeah. Hello, my name's Jeremy Malcolm. I'm Australian, but I've been living in Malaysia for almost six years. And one thing that you may not know about Malaysia is that they have an active stand-up comedy scene here. Uh, one of the staples of the scene is that the Chinese, Indian, and Malay comedians will all make fun not only of their own race, which we could do in Australia as well, but also of all the other races. Um, and using some pretty offensive stereotypes, which I'm not going to repeat here. So in honour of that, I'm going to do the same thing. Although it's not going to be stand-up comedy, and the races that I'm going to be talking about are not Chinese, Indian, or Malay, but the internet technical community and civil society. And I can do this because I myself uh, have a technical and a civil society background. So if I offend anyone here, be assured that I'm offending myself as well. And uh, having said that, in present company, it's probably best if I begin by offending civil society. So. To techies, civil society is a bogus concept. Um, it refers to a bunch of failed career politicians who lack a basic understanding of the technology behind the internet, have no legitimacy to represent internet users as they claim to do, and litter their conversation with stupid acronyms like WISIS, MDGs and LDCs. To civil society, on the other hand, the technical community are a bunch of narrow-minded, politically libertarian geeks who can't or refuse to understand the policy dimensions of technology or how it is shaped by power and money and who litter their conversation with stupid acronyms like BGP, MPLS and DNSSEC. Civil society loves to use human rights to justify all sorts of demands and are endlessly critical of big business and America and other rich countries for not fulfilling these supposed rights. 
but they never display an ounce of gratitude for the fact that without those same companies and countries supported by the technical community, they wouldn't even have any internet to complain about. The technical community, on the other hand, has a massive superiority complex. They think that because they know about routing or DNS, they also know politics. In fact, they know it better than the politicians do because the technical community's processes for standards development and resource allocation are actually the best processes in the world for doing anything. And you can apply them without any changes to the political realm. So this is where we're at. Both the internet technical community and civil society think that they know it all and that the other side is stupid and naive. And since I identify with both sides, you can just imagine the extent of my self-loathing. But we have to move on from that because the future of the internet depends on the two sides learning to get along. Both need to recognise their own limitations and the value of what the other side has to contribute. Civil society and the technical community may hate each other sometimes, but could they really be a perfect match? I think the answer is yes. And the reason is Edward Snowden. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Changes to internet governance have nothing to do with Snowden's revelations about NSA surveillance. And you're right in a narrow sense. The DNS route, for example, is not going to be any less secure just because the NSA is headquartered in the same country as I can. But what Edward Snowden did do is to bring the technical community and civil society together in agreement on one point, that the status quo needs to change. And that is the turning point for our communities. The Montevideo Statement, Fadi Chahade's role in the establishment of the Net Mundial 2014 meeting, and most recently ISOC's announcement that it would finally support the IGF developing recommendations. None of these would have happened without Edward Snowden. And it's not all one way. Civil society is also realising that it needs to expand its own horizons beyond its little goldfish bowl. Two years ago, I perceived there was a disconnect between the NGOs that I was working with on internet governance issues and the digital rights groups from North America who were campaigning for internet freedom, many of whom were closely linked with the technical community. So we were doing similar things, but we weren't coordinating very well with each other or even talking. So I formed a new civil society, or we formed a new civil society network called Best Bits to bring these movements together. Taking this a step further was the formation of the OneNet initiative last year by the technical community organisations who invited civil society in also. OneNet has taken some missteps, but the promise of this initiative is to bring the internet technical community and broader civil society together to share their own different experiences of the internet, their own opinions of what its core values are, and their ideas about joint strategies to preserve its value and to address its shortcomings. So I hope and believe that the future of the internet technical community and civil society is together. When we fight with each other, it gets ugly, and I know this better than most. But together, we could just save the internet. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Any questions? Do you have one? Four and a half minutes oh. for questions. Yes. Adiel, use the mic, please. We have remote participants. Yes, thank you very much, Jeremy, for this uh, very good presentation of the situation and um, your, I would say, almost fair view of who, where we are right now. Um, I, I, I like your conclusion as well about uh, we have to do something um, as from now and working together. Uh, one of the questions I have, and I would like to hear from the people from the region specifically, is how how this can happen and uh, about the One Net initiative. That's that's Jeremy. Really talk about how we can make it um, a more, um, I would say, a result oriented, because I think that is the goal. How can we make those two very uh, interesting de description you have of technical community and civil society together uh, in order to address this? But we are missing out some other um, big player here as well, which is the the, the industry, the business community, who also have a big stake in this whole uh, discussion. So I'm, I'm more interested, I'm, I'm very much interested to know a bit more about that. Well, uh, 
I agree that OneNet is, is kind of missing the, the business side um, and it also, of course, missing the government. But that's not so much of a problem in itself because I think the uh, non-governmental groups need to have a space of their own and that's what OneNet could be. Um, but I don't know that we yet have enough common ground to be as results oriented as, as you would probably like to see OneNet being. And I also agree that I'm all for results but you need to have some more common ground before you can you can reach that point. And we've really been forced into a situation where we're talking about results almost before we're ready of it, ready for it, because we've got this uh, Brazil meeting coming up in April. Um, we've got the enhanced cooperation discussions at the CSTD going on right now. Um, we've got various commissions popping up here, there, and everywhere to talk about changes to internet governance. So uh, now is the hot time to be making uh, specific recommendations and delivering specific outputs, but we're still in disagreement about some core uh, values that are going to determine what those outputs and uh, recommendations should be. So um, I think uh, it's going to be um, a, a trial by fire. Like we'll see if we come out of this with some agreement on some changes to internet governance. Um, if we don't, then then we can try again uh, after we've created a bit more common ground. But I'm really interested to see, like, are we actually going to be able to agree on some, some changes in April or, or later this year? We have a minute and 35 seconds for feedback from folks in the region that Adio was asking for. Anybody? I guess not. If not, thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. for that, Jeremy. Jan, you're next. I think you're next. So, no problem is. Goes. Do you want to walk? Stop. So, hello, my name is Jan Josh. I'm from Internet Society. And I will just give a quick update about uh, the best kind of operational practices that uh, we are trying to uh, stimulate uh, around the world. And when, because I have just 10 minutes, I will just be very, very quick. Uh, it's about me. I come from Slovenia. Um, uh, I'm more involved in the RIPE community. Uh, so this is my first time in this community, uh, and I enjoy it very much. I come from op op operational world. I've been building and running networks for the last 20 years or more. And uh, I joined the Internet Society in 2012. Um, so um, what is the best kind of operational practice? I've, I've given this talk uh, also at our uh, ISOC workshop on Wednesday. Uh, and now I'm giving it again with the secret hope that there is no overlap of the uh, audience and we get some more um, uh, people to listen to and uh, maybe some more feedback. So uh, best current operational practice, this is a document that is describing how uh, today uh, the, the networks are run and how uh, new technologies are deployed. Um, let's bring away as soon as possible uh, the question that I get every time, what's the difference between BCP and BCOP? BCOP. Uh, BCP is the IETF series of best current practices that can be written by anyone. So this is actually a wish how the, the technology should be implemented. Best current operational practice is the document that can be written only by experienced operators and vetted by the community. So um, a problem statement. Some people don't come to, to operate. But they, the experienced operators that already did it, uh, document it, and uh, publish somewhere that can be easily accessible. Another problem is that all this information is already stored, but in different formats. There's a lot of clutter in IT space. So um, we think that, that well-organized and um, um, open uh, repository 
when when the documents that are really of a good and great quality uh, would be accessible is a great idea. So, okay, I've been talking about this. So the solution, we are trying to start um, the big up efforts around the world in different regions. You will see later where. Um, we think that this would speed up the IPv6, the deployment of IPv6 of the NSSEC and other key standards. It would make uh, the network more resilient um, and would simply simplify network deployment for uh, less travel operators or newcomers. Um, and we as Internet Society are committed in assisting um, uh, the creation and promotion of these uh, repositories. So what is a BICOP repository? Very quickly, it should be open, it should be bottom-up, this is absolutely a must. It should be transparent and it should be ongoing. This is especially important because current operational practices changes and the documents that are describing them needs to be re reviewed every so often and, and see if they are still uh, reflecting the, the, the best current operational changes uh, practices. They also should be free from organizational agendas. Um, we are doing good things with the internet. Uh, let's, let's keep organizations back at home and do some good stuff uh, for, for everyone else. And it should be the synthesized knowledge from the entire community. These are the best ways how to, how to get uh, things working. Um, and of course, it's an advancement of the internet to all reaches of the world and beyond. So this is the proposed um, ar architecture, let's say it. The first proposed architecture was like uh, more heavy or the top heavy and it was, it was criticized by the operational communities. This one is uh, bottom up completely. And our idea is simply let's get the content in the region started and the global like structure or, or cooperation might emerge by a natural need. Um, like it is emerging now, uh, we have five regions and, uh, and the four uh, BCOPs. We have Nanoc BCOP, RIPE BCOP, uh, LECNOC BCOP, and FNOC BCOP that is starting up in Djibouti. We don't have Apricot BCOP or APNIC BCOP, I don't know. But this needs to come from the community. We are just saying it might be a good idea. So what we are doing, we are searching for um, people with lots of energy and visibility in the community that are willing to lead this uh, big up efforts and then we see how it goes. We make a buff or something like this. So if these people emerge and uh, talk to us, we can, we can make it work. Uh, what we are currently doing as Internet Society, we are maintaining the web page with just the URL pointers where the work is being done and how the things are emerging um, around of the world. And this is briefly in Africa region. Um, we had a bath in Ivory Coast. We have another one probably, hopefully, in uh, Djibouti. Um, so in Latin America we started the BCOP task force with, uh, with Carlos Martinez and Antonio Marcos Moreiras. We have an of BCOP track established uh, with uh, Chris, he's here, and, and Aaron as the co-chairs. Uh, at at, in Europe, uh, I'm, um, so Ben Oberander and myself are co-chairing the BCOP task force. In the Middle East, uh, we still did not hear back from MINOC, what's going on. So, and uh, in Asia, well, um, uh, uh, Seichi-san and uh, Maz uh, uh, are, are co-chairing the JANOC one. Uh, they started it, they need to form it up. And in NZNOC, there was some interest from, from um, Dean Perberton to start the whole thing. So small things are already happening in the region, but we need we need more regional effort to be started. And um, how much time do I have? Four minutes, three minutes, okay. So these are some of identified topics, mainly from Nanoc and RIPE region. These were identified by the operators. Uh, the operators would like to write uh, stuff about uh, these topics. So, the, the, the things I like the most here is pingable attribute and here is this is like wow wow this is gonna hurt uh, there is more topics 
So for, for example, how to test your network performance, uh, how to check your visibility from a global internet, this is particularly important. Lots of ISPs don't have don't have a clue. They, they think, oh, we connect to this one, we connect to this one, we announce our resources, and there's the internet. They have no idea that they might not be visible from some parts of the internet. So document like this would be a really good idea to make them understand even that, that the visibility is important. Um, and so on and so forth. So we also need more suggestions. This is completely an open um, uh, project or, or process. It is, it should be owned by the operators, for uh, done by operators for operators. Um, we are just here to help and facilitate um, the whole thing and talk about it and and uh, gather some some uh, in interest. And just as, as I mentioned, I presented this uh, yesterday at, uh, at uh, AP IPv6 uh, task force. We started as, uh, as one of the, the examples, we started the documents that documents uh, the practice of generic IPv6 troubleshooting procedures from help desks around the world. Uh, you see the list of contributors. These are big operators from, from uh, mainly from uh, Europe and uh, North America. Uh, and it's a very simple document that uh, techie people that deployed IPv6 but are afraid of uh, rolling it out to the uh, end customers um, because they think that their help desk uh, knows nothing about IPv6 and will just burn down and burn in flame if they enable IPv6 for everyone. Um, so this is just a simple set of like seven uh, scenarios that they can de detect. We build a tool with Jason Fessler for uh, testipv6.com. It's isp.testipv6.com um, that people can read and we build a document with a very simple set of instructions how to identify and tackle the IPv6 problem on a first level help desk where the um, where the uh, acceleration, uh, not uh, um, uh, where the um, uh, other procedures are necessary, like I don't know MTU issues, this like a first level help desk cannot um, uh, figure out what to do. The, the escalation is needed, right? So, um, switch it off. Okay, so that's it. So this is going to be published in uh, two weeks' time, and you can read it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jan. That was great. Yeah. Fast forward. Fast forward. Thank you. OK. Chris. Full screen. Do you want to walk or stand? Or? Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about some other projects that Jan and I are working on. I'm going to start with the team here. It's uh, myself, Dan York, Megan Cruz, and Jan Zors. Uh, we're called the Deployment and Operationalization Team at the Internet Society, and we're really focused on, on obviously those two things, and, and look, facing outwards towards the operators. Um, we have three projects running right now. Jan just talked about uh, BCOP and the efforts we're working on there to facilitate that. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is the Deploy360 program and our new operators in the IETF efforts. So the Deploy360 program, um, really is looking at how to take IETF standards and work with the first adopters to document practical case studies, pragmatic information on how to actually roll out those technologies, right? So that the, you know, the nuts and bolts of actually rolling it out on the network versus the RFCs that cover how to build it in software. Uh, and bring that out to the fast followers. So all of you folks who want to deploy things like IPv6, DNSSEC, how to secure BGP, um, TLS for applications developers, so on and so forth. We, we identify topics that are good for the common good and need to be deployed by everyone to benefit everyone and then try and help everyone deploy them by providing the information needed. Um, so that works in two ways, right? One is we put the information out and also we need information coming in from folks who are deploying these things. So the way we're doing this is, is kind of in a four-phased uh, approach or, or four pieces of this. Obviously we have the web portal, which uh, is where all the technical documentation goes up. And a lot of this is actually links out to other documentation. Because sometimes, um, you know, other people have already written documentation and have great documentation up, and as long as they're maintaining it, you know, we just point to that. We don't want to be um, the one stop. We want to be, you know, the place where you can come and find all the information, and not necessarily all the information, but the best information. 
Uh, and then through social media, we advertise out all this information, and also we try to use social media to interact with the community and with, with, with operators so we can get feedback on whether or not you're getting the right information. All right, so what do you need? You can come tell us uh, through social media. Obviously, also speaking engagements, because in person uh, is even better, higher bandwidth to be able to communicate those things. So we come out, um, Jan's an expert on IPv6, Dan York's an expert on DNSSEC and, and uh, voice communications. And so we, we try to bring our expertise out, as well as bring other experts into the community to, to talk about these things. Uh, and, and with that, we have our own conference series, the ION conferences, which are always co-located with another event, and uh, again, bring people who have expertise into environments where the people who need the expertise are. So first, a little deeper look at the web portal here. Um, content's broken out right now by the three main topics we're working on, which is IPv6, DNSSEC, and securing BGP. We're going to be rolling out more topics throughout this year, and then continuing on, obviously, in the years ahead, uh, we'll be rolling out more topics. And we also have content that's specific to each individual um, segment, right? So hopefully you can find information that's relevant to what you're doing right now fairly easily. We also have blog posts. We keep up to date with news and events and things that are going on in these spheres around the, the topics that we focus on. Uh, and then, as I said, the social media integration. Basically, it's Deploy360 wherever you go. So whatever your favorite way of, of communicating with people online is, um, you can get a hold of us. Right? We're on SoundCloud, we're on Twitter, Facebook, Google+. We have a YouTube uh, account for videos, um, and then also uh, an RSS feed as well. If you want to just keep up to date with, with everything as we publish it, you can kind of watch the feed come out. And again, we're, we're looking for bidirectional communication here. Right? This isn't just uh, a broadcast medium. The reason we're on social media is because you can provide feedback. Uh, and We want to hear it. The ION conferences, as I mentioned, um, are usually co-located, or so far are always co-located with another event. And we do that to try and reach out to new audiences. We try to move them around different places in the world, different types of conferences that we co-locate them with to really get out there into as many communities as possible and share this information and also find experts that we can you know, bring information in. Uh, the ones in 2013 were uh, Singapore, Krakow, and Toronto. Um, and again, we've had past events uh, all over the world. Uh, at that link there, there's uh, information on all the past events, uh, including speakers and presentations and videos from all the talks. And, uh, and also future information as well. And uh, really, the ION conferences, are, again, are all about bringing experts who have deployed these technologies into the room where you can talk to them and interact with them and ask questions and, uh, and, and really kind of fill out your knowledge of, of whatever this, you know, topic it is, whether it's IPv6, DNSSEC, or, or something in the future. Again, we're all over the world speaking, um, including here, obviously, today. And, and then really, this is one of the big pieces here. Um, your participation is obviously key, right? So you can visit and explore the site. It's basically internetsociety.org slash deploy360. And then, of course, also we'll create content, right? Many of you are also experts in some areas. So hopefully you can, you know, learn from content on one side and then the things that you're experts in, maybe provide content back in. And so uh, you can email us at, at deploy360 at isoc.org. Uh, if you have, uh, you know, any information that you think uh, is worth putting up, you know, again, case studies, Really, you know, the pragmatic operational information uh, from the real world on how these things went, things you ran into, problems you had, um, ways you found to, uh, to do things, it's great. And of course, also defining your features, right? So anything that, that you think we could do that we're not doing, we'd love to hear it and we'd love to try and help. We're really just here to, to help and to uh, provide whatever we can for you. So that's, that, that's the end of the Deploy360, and I'd like to talk about another project as well, um, which is why I'm talking as fast as I am. Uh, so operators in the ITF is a new project we're launching, and really what we're looking at is this ideal of this perfect world where operational realities actually inform the creation of all standards, right? So that the ITF is there creating protocols and creating standards and, and creating the BCPs even, uh, understands what's going on in the real world and what's ha happening, you know, on the streets, on the wire, in real networks. Uh, unfortunately, that's not what's actually going on right now to a large extent. I hear... Um, you know, the last few years I've been traveling around the world, going to conferences, doing talks, I hear over and over again from operators that they don't feel like they're welcome at the IETF, or they don't feel like their voice is heard at the IETF, or they just feel like sometimes the IETF isn't quite, you know, making that connection between um, the theoretical best possible scenario and what's actually happening in real networks. So, we'd like to facilitate increased operational input into the IETF. Um, and what does that mean? Well, we don't know quite yet, right? We really want to map the problem space first. And so, the first phase of this project is asking you, why don't you go to the ITF? Why don't you participate in the ITF? Um, what could help you to participate in the ITF more? And how can we get that operational input into the ITF on a more regular basis? Right? What are the barriers? 
Uh, and then once we know the problems, hopefully we can start looking for solutions. So this is your opportunity to help us uh, fix any problems that are there. And the first thing is there's an online survey. Uh, as well, come talk to me and Jan. Tell us, right? Um, we'll, we'll grab a beer and, and talk about the IETF or, or anything else. Um, and then the survey, of, of course, also is, is great. We'd really like to get as many responses as possible from all over the world so we can kind of collect up that information and really understand you know, what's going on there. Is it a perceptual problem? Is it a real problem? You know, are there different problems? Are there multiple problems? Is it one thing? Um, and then once we know those problems, we can actually try, try solving them, right? We don't want to have a solution before we know what the actual problem is or if there is one. So how can you help? Um, send us feedback on, on any of the things I've talked about. Um, let us know how we can help you. Uh, what we can do to, uh, to, you know, to, to facilitate the adoption of these technologies and the communication between the IETF and, and operators. Um, let us know if you have that content, if you have written documents, if you have case studies, or if you want to write documents or case studies. Right? We can help with that. And we'd love to get them up and, and get them published and put them in front of other people um, so you can help your, your community as well. Um, invite us to speak um, and, uh, and help connect us to, to other network operators. Right? We'd really like to, to meet as many people as we can and get uh, the Deploy360 resource in front of as many people as we can so that it can help as many people as it can. Right? And, and also with the BCOP as well. Right? I mean, that's, that's what this is all about, is facilitating that communication and ensuring that we all understand how to build uh, the best free and open internet and keep it that way. So this is my, my last slide and my call to arms. Please uh, use Deploy360. Please contribute to Deploy360. And uh, please, please, please take the survey. Uh, it's going to be open for the next few months, so you have time. But the sooner the better, obviously. We'd, uh, I'm going to London. Um, tomorrow, actually, I'm flying to London to talk to people at the IETF. So if you fill out the survey today, I'll have your information, and I'll, I'll be able to represent you a little bit better. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. OK, we have a wee bit of time left, and my backup speaker is here. Azumi, it's all yours. I've got your slides here as well, somewhere. Um, Want to use this one or this one? Hi, so this is uh, Izumi Okutani, and I would like to um, share some of the um, possible implications that uh, we might have on the operations as a result of the ICANN's new GTLD program. And just as a brief recap, um, some of you may, might know that the ICANN's new GTLD pro program expands the namespace on the, the namespace of the GTLDs really drastically by two g digits. So I think we have roughly 20 GTLDs, including .com, .net, .org. But um, as you can see, it seems to be um, over 1,700 according to the current number of applications. So that's a really big expansion. And ICANN has already started its delegations from October last year. And just to give you some ideas of what are the kind of names that are being applied. So you can see some mix of IDN, so it doesn't include just the alphabet, but some of the names like .toko, um, .voyage, email, clothing. So you really wouldn't have imagined that these are the, you know, these would be the GTLD space. So what exactly the issue? So they are actually not very unusual practice for like um, corporate internal system to you know um, assign names within their own discretion, or some cable uh, modem or um, DSL routers. They they just put some names to make help configurations for users, and assuming that this would not um, collide with the names used within the existing GTLDs. But as a result of this huge expansion, some of these names that have been used within um, an internal organization might actually clash. And so potential areas of collisions going a little bit more um, into details, corporate networks or like naming servers or just some kind of system that is only used within your own system, not connecting to the internet. That could be a potential area. And another area is DNS search list. And this um, apparently helps users um, abbreviate the TLDs, as you can see in the case here. So if it's a uh, um, FUDN, the top level domain should be ABC. And then the second level where your organization can um, use their own name is example. 
But if you use the search list, you can abbreviate the ABC part, and then example comes at the top. So it looks very similar that as if example is, you know, as the TLD comes on the top. And there are actually um, what's called internal name certificates. So these are the certificates that have been issued, um, assuming that it's only going to be used within an organization. But it was actually found out as a result of an experiment conduct conducted by ICANN's um, security or stability and resiliency team that these certificates that has actually been issued internally can actually use it, that people can actually um, set up a fake route and then make it look as a proper um, website by using this certificate. And if these collides with the GTLD namespace that is um, being used, it can have security impl implications. And, you know, the list is not just uh, exhaustive. We might, have, we might also have other cases that we're still not aware of. And just to share a specific e example, there actually was a case in Japan last year that um, .cba was used in a gateway of a mansion um, configuration of a network in prefecture called Chiba. And then they were using this CBA for the abbreviation of the place. But this actually collided with a new GTLD application of Common Bank of Australia. So, and then I think this name, this space was leaked out to the public internet, and then so they reported to the MIC, and then they they had to the MIC is is a ministry within Japan that is um, handling like areas of the internet, and then so so all these things happened, and it finally got resolved. So there is actually a real life example of things that is happening. The possible impact uh, is security in terms of security. Um, I explained a little bit about the internal name certificates. The top one is it's pr probably pretty obvious in cases of like when you're using VPN and the difference between the internal network and external network is a little bit blurred. Maybe the communication you, you intended internally just goes out to the public DNS. That could be one example. Reachability, you may not be able to reach the like website that you wanted because you will be referred to the internal um, um, web um, system, vice versa, or direction of email to wrong places, things like that. So how much of this um, thing could, um, how many of these collisions could uh, potentially happen? And there's actually data extracted from DNS or ARCs, uh, gain the light of the internet. And this is the number of queries that has been made to the root DNS. And as a result, um, it was found out that from the proposed uh, TLD space, um, uh, about 3% actually collided with the, um, the um, GTLD that has actually been applied this time. And then 19%, because ICANN plans to um, do the second round, third round, so um, 19 is like it's actually able to exist as um, TLDs, but it doesn't, it hasn't been applied this time. So it's, I'll leave it up to you if this is big or small, but, and then out of, sorry, it's difficult to see. Out of um, the top um, names that are being queried, .home, which is on the fifth, and the 15th on .corp, those were the top TLDs that are being applied this time and which was found as the top, um, within top 15 queries made um, to the root DNS. And this is like, uh, you can actually see from the research that has been published by the ICANN, which are the number of queries um, from the top that matches with the TLDs that are being applied this time. So measures taken so far by ICANN is that .corp, .corp and .home, um, they have made the decision um, to defer the delegations indefinitely, which means they will probably not ever uh, delegate those to space. And I'll make sure that um, on internal name certificates, which, ha which has been issued um, and matches with the GTLD space, will be revoked after um, ICANN signs the contract with this applied um, um, no, with the applicant of the GTLD. And also provide information, I, if you click the link over here, you can see all the information about the background, measures to be taken, things like that. So what are the remaining issues? Um, actually, so in terms of the numbers, .corp and .home is the top, but there are actually 
there wasn't maybe, I'm not sure if it's like there was a few or not a single TLD that doesn't match with, um, with the TLDs that have been applied. So you can see that there are more or less some kind of implications. And what the ICANN is trying to do is, okay, we can't just stop, you know, delegating all the TLDs, but maybe at the second level when, like, the collision is quite high, including the second level, maybe some measures, additional measures should be taken to stop the registrations of those names in the second level. And do more outreach, you know, this is all really, like, you know, big debate within the ICANN community, but a lot of you probably not so interested in the, you know, in the um, area. So uh, trying to reach out to this um, community outside of the ICANN and ESSEC, um, this um, advisory committee uh, within the ICANN that adv gives advice about um, security and um, stability. Um, they have, um, you know, um, gathered some reports and one of them is suggesting the ICANN to define private domain name. So it's a little bit like private address space, but the domain name version. And another idea that they're putting up in another report is that um, how the search list of, um, responds to the search queries really varies depending on, on which one you're using. So maybe have a better like um, standard criteria to make sure that what's going to happen and we know what to expect. So a lot of these is actually not visible from the internet. So we really don't know if this this exhaustive list of implications or impact. And I'm not going to go through um, all these list of things that you can do, but uh, this is just the, you know, the steps that you can take in case you're using private TLD or you, you, in case your name collides you know, with the search list that you're using. So please refer to them later if you think that you know, your namespace might clash. And uh, just uh, two, two slides. So what has been done in Japan so far is we feel that we should do more outreach, especially within our own language, and then reach out to the stakeholders who are relevant. So we set up a working group to do this, and uh, we have also made presentations in DNS operators conference, Japan network operators con conference, et cetera, et cetera. So lastly, what specifically can you do? So check your end case. So there is actually a list of GTLDs that are being applied. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so maybe you can just see what you can do. <laughs> I'm thinking maybe, it's, is it my voice or my stomach? Or, you, know? <laughs> you didn't hear it at the start. Thank you very much, Azumi. <laughs> So all the presentation slides will go on the website over the next day or so, so you'll be able to relive the experience. Um, so we had nine presentations in the last 90 minutes. I would like to thank all the Lightning Talk speakers and everybody else who contributed or volunteered a bit of their time as well. So it's always one of the more enjoyable parts of Apricot for me. It's, it's amazing what can just come up when you ask people a week or so out of, of what they can present. So uh, certainly for me, it's, it's quite a lot of fun. So. Um, that brings us to the end of the Lightning Talk session. Um, after the tea coffee break, we have the closing plenary, which is downstairs in the Grand Cayman's room. So enjoy your break, and we'll see you there. Thank you. <laughs>